divine intervention. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And as these armies of enemies came toward the city, sure that they were going to be triumphed by the power of triumph and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the whole concourse of the armies was gripped. And not only gripped and stopped in their tracks, they were filled with an awesome fear. I, I don't know that this generation of ours knows very much about awe. The, the kind of thing that, that makes you shut up and become astonished and in measure begin to be a bit trembling. Well, that's what happened to these armies. And instead of launching their attack, their attack they turned and in panic they fled. It was God who did it. There were no fireworks. God doesn't need fireworks. He's not a show-off. There were no mighty rumblings or thunders, although God is perfectly capable of that. But there just came... I, I, I find it most... I find it very deeply moving. There came upon that massive army of enemy a spirit of trembling and they just knew that they couldn't raise their power against the holy city of Jerusalem and they fled. If you read church history you will read of times when by the same Holy Spirit there came upon whole communities such an awareness of God and such a conviction of sin that not only the social life but often the very business life of communities came to a standstill because by the power of that Holy Spirit whole communities were convicted of sin and the only thing that mattered was to seek God and to find forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ. Some of you here have read the book by J. Edwin Orr entitled The Great Second Evangelical Awakening, The Revival of 1859. And these stories of revival tell of some places where the power of the Holy Spirit came upon, upon whole communities with such power that practically all the public houses went out of business because all their customers were converted. The power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this psalm is all about. God's power operating for the defense and the deliverance of his people. Now don't ask me how God did it. It's none of your business, it's none of my business. But you see, there are many illustrations or instances of this kind of thing in the scriptures, too many to enumerate tonight, but you could go, for example, to the book of Joshua, and in one of the stories there we are told that, that the sun stood still because more daylight was needed for the final defeat of the enemy to take place. Oh, you say that can't happen. Well, you say that. I'm not going to say that. I believe in God. God the creator, the God who orders the circling planets. You could go to the book of Judges and you read there the, the strange, astonishing, but rather thrilling statement that the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, I don't know what that means, but if it means in sovereign and supernatural power that God watches over his people and intervenes on their behalf, then I'm prepared to lay my understanding aside and find the sweetest comfort and assurance. Psalms 46, 47 and 48 belong together. But the real emphasis, especially when we come to Psalm 48, is not on circumstances or on experiences, but on God. On God as the rock and refuge of his people, that's Psalm 46. God as the king who reigns over his people, that's Psalm 47. 
God as our God. That's Psalm 48. It says it in verse 8. The city of our God. It says it in verse 14. This God is our God forever and forever. I was reading in my brother's daily notes in the magazine of Holyrood Abbey Church in Edinburgh, and with regard to this psalm, he says, it teaches what God is to the church, its refuge, its contemporary God, its protector, and its resident God. And secondly, it teaches not what God is to the church, but what the church is to God, the object of his love, his pleasure, and his delight. People say to me from time to time, they say some nice things, say some not nice things as well, but people say to me sometimes, oh, I love coming to Sandyford. That's nothing compared to what God feels for his church. Whether great massive congregations or two or three gather together in some little highland hamlet. What, what the church is to God, the object of his love. What do you think of that? That you are the object of God's love that you are the object of God's pleasure that that God looks down and mentions your names oh so and so is here tonight that's what it means it's, it's all terribly personal I feel awfully sorry for the people who feel that, feel that God's terribly far away he's not he, he's not some first principle of the universe. He's a person who cares. And the church is the object of God's love and pleasure and God's delight. And one more thing I want to say before we get down to the detailed study of the verses. The reference in the psalm, of course, to Zion, city of our God, Jerusalem, Zion or Jerusalem is not just the capital city of Judah, not just the city of David, which I'm told was more impressive in these Old Testament days than it is now. Certainly the temple, which was Solomon's temple, was a far grander structure than Herod's temple, the ruins of which, the base stones of which can still be seen in contemporary Jerusalem. Zion, city of our God, it was, the, was and is the symbol of God's work and God's word and God's kingdom. The worldwide kingdom of God down through the ages of history. And the emphasis of this psalm is that Zion, the work of God, is glorious. I can't remember the exact words, but I was, when I was preparing for this service, I was thinking away back to the days of my assistantship in Springburn, when, believe it or not, all the Church of Scotland ministers met for a Monday morning prayer meeting. And I remember one Monday morning, and I'm certainly not at my best on a Monday morning, especially early on in the Monday morning, this minister prayed. don't know anybody here will remember him except perhaps the session clerk the minister of Colston Wellpark, little man, a scholarly man, not a very inspiring man. I'm not sure about his theology at all. But as he prayed that morning, that group of ministers, I can still remember it. I can still remember my own reaction. He prayed to the effect, Oh God, remind us that we are not the broken down remnants of a forgotten army but part of the church militant. And oh, my heart thrilled. Saviour, if of Zion City, I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in 
thy name. And I think we need to learn to thrill at being part of the church of Jesus Christ. And I testify to you that it is only when I forget this that I get cast down by the pressure of immediate circumstances and by the disappointments of immediate circumstances. And time and time again, as no doubt you've heard me before, but repetition's good. Time and time again I go to the opening verse of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians where he addresses the Christians in Corinth together with all those in every place who call upon the name of the Lord. Do you ever pause on a Sunday to think worldwide of how many people are gathering together to worship God and sing his praise? And if by some of the magnificent and mysterious scientific capabilities that we have nowadays, if, if, all, if all the singing of opening psalms and hymns could, as it were, be brought together and, and funneled through one loudspeaker, th think of all those in every place who call upon the name of the Lord, singing, for example, the old hundred, all people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord, Oh, if, if we could hear it. I tend to think that our dear folk in heaven might be able to hear it. And I can think of them sometimes and I say, Oh, listen, listen. Yes, we, yes, we know the world's in an awful mess. We know it's evil and broken and tormented and all that kind of thing. But I can think of the saints redeemed in heaven. Oh, listen, listen, oh, listen to them this Sunday. And echoing round the whole universe, the words of the old hundred, what a song it would be. But you see, do we think like that? Or do we go, oh, wasn't there a very big congregation today? Or the singing wasn't, have, well, the singing's actually been good today. But, but do we, do we, do we become gloomy and interned? forgetting that we are part of God's glorious church, this glorious Zion. Perhaps we should sing more often than we do the hymn, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Our God is marching on. Oh, it's a great thought. I see I've written down in my notes here that I shall be quoting from glorious things of the earth spoken Zion, but I've, I've quoted already. Saviour if of Zion city, I through grace a member of. Oh, say Psalm 48. Grasp this and rejoice. And so we come to verses 1 to 3 of the psalm. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. You see, there's a lot of things in the Psalms that are better felt than telt. In other words, they're very difficult to put into words. But I don't know about you, but I sure am feeling them tonight. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Oh, it, it's all about the greatness of God and the goodness of God and the sureness of God. Not, not just in one particular historical situation, but in every situation and in relation to his people. I, I remember, uh, I know practically no Greek. I think I had to get five marks in the New Testament exam at Divinity College in order to pass and at great effort and a lot of sweat, I got the five marks. I know little Greek and not, no Hebrew, but somebody pointed out to me that literally the Hebrew of the first verse of Psalm number 73 is, Truly God is good and nothing but good to his people. And that's another verse that thrills my heart. And we mustn't allow our defective recognition or our limited faith 
or our equally limited and complicated experience to blot out the fact that God is great and greatly to be praised. But there is more to be grasped than just the greatness and the goodness and the glory of God. It is the fact that God is resident among his people. If God hadn't been there in Jerusalem, Jerusalem would have been nothing. It was because it was God's city. It was because it was the dwelling place of God that it was glorious. It is not the situation of Jerusalem, although it's a very impressive situation. That's why in the Bible you always read, whatever direction they're coming from, that people are going up to Jerusalem. It's that kind of city. But it's not the situation of the city nor the temple within it. It's not the architecture of the city or the temple, although the temple was a glorious building. Nor is it the past history of Jerusalem or Zion or the church that is the glory of it. It is not the crowds. It's not the liturgy. It's not the music. Although all these can be a blessing. It is God's presence. And if you, and I'd be surprised if you haven't been blessed tonight already. Oh, I hope you have. But if you have been blessed by any part of this service, the reason for that blessing is simply this, that God is here. It's not because this is Sandyford. It's not because I'm the minister. It's not because it's any particular kind of ministry. Although no doubt there's something to be said for all of these. It is because God is here. There's an old hymn that begins, God is here and that to bless us. I suppose the same as I do when I'm congregation rather up than up on my perch. When I'm congregation, I sometimes look and say, oh, so-and-so's here and so-and-so's here. Do we ever pause before a service and just in the quietness of our own mind and heart and spirit say, God is here. And why is he here? God is here to bless his people. Because that is his pleasure. You know, there are some folk talk to me in a way that almost give me the impression that they think that God's a bit grudging with his blessing. Not a bit of it. It is his pleasure to bless his people. And Zion, the city of God, Jerusalem, the city of David or the church of Jesus Christ, or the various churches of Jesus Christ, would be nothing, would be no use at all, if God was not there. And God's presence may not be demonstrated in any visible way, as it often was in the Old Testament, you know, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Nor is God's presence often uh, manifested or demonstrated as it was in the case of the young 18 or 20 year old Isaiah who terribly down in the dumps one day crept away into the temple just to be quiet and I think to moan to God about how bad things were. And as he sat there in the empty kirk the place suddenly became brilliant with light. 
the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And Isaiah, oh, I don't, I don't need to be down in the dumps. Yes, things are bad, but God is here. But as we were saying last night in the Bible study and prayer meeting, God's presence can sometimes be presumed upon. We just expect him to be here. But he's not our servant. God's presence can become something that we become accustomed to. And we take his presence and his blessing for granted. But I believe that if God is grieved in that way by his people, God withdraws. As God can withdraw from an individual life, or God can withdraw from a congregation. And then you have situations that are spoken about in the Bible that the glory is departed. The presence of God has departed. And an individual life or a family home or a congregation, because God has been grieved and presumed upon and taken for granted, these places become cold, dull, lifeless. They may, still, may, they may still be places of religion. But you know, God's departure may not be noticed. Do you remember some of you when we were doing the opening chapters of the book of Revelation? The beginning of chapter 3, God said to one church, one congregation, You have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. You've still got a reputation of being spiritual and biblical and committed in all the rest of it. But it's not true. And if that can be said about a congregation, I, it can be said about a minister. And it can be said about any other individual Christian. Perhaps you're thinking as I'm thinking about the story of Samson in the book of Judges. He was a character. He was very gifted. He was a man with a great drive. Oh, he was a man who did wonderful things in the service of God. But he was a man who became self-willed and self-centered and self-pleasing. And there came a time when Samson said, I'll, I'll go out and do the work of God as I've done before. But it says in the Bible, he did not know that God had departed from him. What made Zion? What made the church, what made any individual congregation of the church a place of life and of blessing was the presence of God. But of course, <clears throat> we must not limit God to any locality, even though I've, I'm quite sure God does choose places, God does choose places to bless. For those of you who don't know, in 1956 or 1955, it was the considered opinion of Glasgow Presbytery that this particular church should be closed down. And in terms of church statistics, it should have been closed down. And the only reason it wasn't is that God put his hand upon this place. And that's something I've never forgotten. This is not my church. This is not your church. It's God's. Yes, God chooses certain places, but we mustn't in any sense limit God to any, any locality or any group of people. 
I was looking up the references. Oh, wait, we haven't time really to turn them up tonight. Second Chronicles chapter 6 verse 18 about the dedication of Solomon's great temple. Will God dwell indeed with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain him. How much less this house which I have built, said Solomon. Psalm 139 verse 10. Though I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the earth, even there thy right hand shall hold me. Zion, city, of our God. Oh, there are so many references. I, I'm not sure that I quite understand the one in Hebrews chapter 12. Let, let, me, let me read this to you. Hebrews chapter 12. You have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet. That, that's a picture of, the, of Mount Sinai when God gave the law to Moses. Moses says the word, it's not that you've come to. They could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. So it goes on. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels gathered in general assembly. Oh, what a picture. I was thrilled many, many years ago when my mother who used to wear the Salvation Army uniform, told me of how in these old days in the Salvation Army, when one of their members died, one of the soldiers died, they spoke about him having been promoted to glory. What a thought. Holy Zion, the church of the living God. And you see, my friends, if we are part of that, not because we deserved it, but by the grace of God we sang it. Saviour, if of Zion city, I through grace a member. Oh, if we are part of that here in history, and if we are going to be part of that in the glory of eternity, then we should understand the first three verses of the psalm. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. But in the next verses of the psalm, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, are verses that really expound or state in very, very plain terms the weakness of evil. They assembled, they came, their intentions were wicked, their power was mighty, they saw Zion, Fear gripped them, and they fled. Oh, you say, preacher, that kind of thing doesn't happen now. Are you sure? I think when we get to heaven, and we understand things a lot better then than we do now, We'll look back and we'll see, time, we'll see in our own life experience times when we were in immense danger, when people of evil and powers of evil were closing in upon us and, and maneuvering us into disastrous situations. And without our knowing it, God in his sovereign power simply said, now, that's enough. Leave him alone. Let her alone. No nearer. We read in both the Old Testament and New Testaments that the people of God seem always have to be facing battles and difficulties. And we shouldn't be surprised at that because we're in a fallen, alien world. And therefore, as Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I, notice not we, I have overcome the world. 
and to all the persons and powers of evil, that Savior of ours, whose name is Jesus, can say at the right time, now, no nearer, no nearer that child of mine, no greater temptation, and he pushes them away. And people might say to us, how are you feeling this week? Is what oh, past few days have been pretty awful, but oh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better now. Aye. Because somebody called Jesus heard the prayers of some of your friends when you weren't able to pray for yourself. And in answer to these prayers, the powers of temptation were restrained and drawn back. Aren't you glad you've got a Jesus who watches over you like that? Again, too many references. Job chapter 38. I know it's to do with creation and the sea. And the great God of creation said to the waves, thus far and no further. Psalm number two. Oh, it's a great psalm. I'm trying to read it accurately. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us bust their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. There are, the, there are the kings and powers of evil, all bolstering their own confidence in their evil. And God, look at them. And the Lord laughs. He has them in derision. You can read the same in the second, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. The, the emergence of the, cri the crisis of history of the lawless one, the very Antichrist himself. And all the powers of evil seem to rise in that person. And the Lord, with the breath of his mouth, deals with them just like that. These verses 4 to 8, the weakness of evil. But I point out to you verse 8 where they say, As we have heard, so we have seen. Do you see what it means? They're saying, oh, we've, we've heard the stories of God's mighty acts in the past. But now we've seen it for ourselves. And we've known it. And we've proved, I remember years ago, the person concerned won't mind my saying this tonight. It, it won't embarrass you. It was a medical person, a very well qualified medical person, who had to go into hospital for an operation. And it's generally accepted that medical people are really the poorest patients. Maybe it's because they know so much. And this person was no ex exception. But this the person told me afterwards. When they were, I think it was when they were on the trolley being wheeled along to the theater for the operation. This person said, Oh, it was, it was just the peace of God that passes understanding. And they said, oh, It was astonishing. Now that person had heard lots of sermons about the peace of God and the God of peace. But what they had heard, they had now proved. And that's what they are saying here. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts and the city of our God, which God establishes forever. Think of that. Verses 9, 10, and 11. We hurry on. If the first few verses, verses 1 to 3... God is great and greatly to be praised. Verses 4 to 8, the weakness of evil. Verses 9, 10, and 11, rejoicing in God. We pointed it out as we read in verse 9. We have thought on, not we have thought of, or we have thought about. We have thought on. You need the old-fashioned word, and it's not a popular word, and it's not a popular, popular activity nowadays. Ponder. An older generation of Christians, you know, used to speak about 
meditating. We're such a restless generation. We haven't the time to think, let alone meditate. But the psalmist says, we took time to meditate, to ponder. And he says, we have thought on thy steadfast love, O God. Now, what a subject to think about. God's steadfast love. There's a hymn we sometimes sing in our supplementary hymn book that has the word in it, Why, O Lord, such love to me? Do you ever take time to, do you ever take time to think why God should love you? Why God should think you're great? Now, no, they all come off it, Mr. Lip. You're, you're being emotional. No, I'm not being emotional. I'm being tremendously realistic. If I remember rightly, we said in our opening prayer, they spoke in our opening prayer about God, who spared not even his son, but gave him up for the likes of you and me. He must have thought we were great. He must have thought we were worth it. And the psalm said, Oh, we have taken time to ponder on thy steadfast love. Think of Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. Can a woman forget her own baby? And the answer is yes. Ah, but says God, I won't forget you. Your name is graven upon the palm of my hand. The steadfast love of God, steady, unwavering, unchanging love, and I'm taking a risk in what I say next, but I know it's true. Nothing we do or fail to do can make God change his steadfast love for the likes of you and me. But look, it says in verse 9, <coughs> we have thought on thy steadfast love, O God, in the midst of thy temple. The best place, the real place to do this is in God's house, among God's people. Not least, it is because when we are committed to God's house, we become part of God's people and being part of God's people sharing joys and sorrows together we grow together and in that commitment we are talking at the Kirk Session meeting on Thursday evening of how nowadays there is a great reluctance on the part of Christians to join a church and there's a reluctance on the part of Christians having joined a church to give their commitment and their loyalty and their love to that church and I'm sorry for Christians who have never joined a fellowship and I'm sorry for those who having joined a fellowship sit lightly to the privilege of membership because they miss so much. We have thought in thy steadfast love, O God, in the midst of thy temple that is in thy house among thy people. As thy name, O God, so thy praise reaches to the ends of the earth. God's love moves the heart. And God's name, when thought upon, kindles praise. And of course, God's name in the scriptures, name signifies character or personality or nature, if you like. And the names of God are fascinating. I was given this little card some time ago. And ever since then, I've kept it in the back of my Bible. It's about the names of God. And all the various names of God linked with the word Jehovah, which is the name here in the psalm. 
In Revelation chapter 1, Jehovah, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. In Genesis chapter 22, Jehovah, Jireh, the Lord will provide. Oh, there's too many of them. Jehovah, Shalom, the Lord who brings peace. Jehovah, Shammah, the Lord is there. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. When the psalmist speaks about the name of God, I think all that crowds into his mind and into the heart. He is the God who is always there. He is the God who says of his people, and I'm quoting from the second chapter of the second last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 2, verse 8, where God, speaking of this Jerusalem, this company of his people, says, the prophet said, He who touches you touches the apple of God's eye. Do you believe that God thinks of you like that? That you are the apple of his eye? That that given a chance, he'll take immense pleasure in speaking about you because he loves you with a steadfast love. That's what we mean to God. That's behind the great verse, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. That's what's behind the words of the third chapter of the first epistle of John. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Because the second half of verse 10, it's time we're stopping. Thy right hand is filled with victory. The right hand of God, the right hand of God's power. And that right hand of God holds our right hand. Well, yes, it says it in the Bible. I wouldn't dare make that statement if it wasn't in the Bible. Listen to it from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Verse 13. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. And, oh, what a thought when you're going into a degree exam. Oh, what a thought when you're going through all sorts of situations. Oh, what a thought, what a thought when you're waiting for the minister to come to conduct the funeral service of the person who's dearest on earth to you. There's a God who holds your right hand. And the God who holds your right hand says, Fear not. I will help you. You know, when we speak of the sovereignty of God, we're usually thinking in terms of his power. But we mustn't forget his tenderness and his gentleness. Isaiah 40, he carries the lambs in his arms. And this is the message and the witness that God's people would bring to the ends of the earth. And I think it's when we realize what a God we have and what he has done for us and what he's going to do for us that we begin to witness. And so the last verses 12, 13, and 14 have to do with our witness to God. We were speaking about this again last night at the prayer meeting. Tell the next generation 
Tell the next generation about this kind of God. Oh, young folk, when you get the chance, listen to old folk who've loved the Lord and served him and prayed for a lifetime. Yes, I sat at the feet of an 80-year-old crippled with arthritis when I was a divinity student. And oh, the quiet, confident faith. You know, it, it does something for you. I can still remember kneeling at the bedside of Jesse Easton's mother in prayer, having spoken with her. Do you tell me of some of the old days and of the great revival meetings? I know of the meeting when John McNeil was the preacher and she was a servant in a big house and she asked the mistress permission that day to go to the meeting. And she got permission to go. And she found Jesus. This is our God. Tell the next generation. Tell the children. Tell the teenagers. Tell the young married folk. This is our God. And tell the young folk this. I am show them this. As we said last night in the prayer meeting, so that when we are dead and gone, there will be a new generation that knows their God to carry God's work forward into the future. This is our God. Oh, I love it. Our God. Our God. Forever and forever. And our life is hid with Christ and God. And in this God we have life and we have purpose and we have sureness of hope right through life right through death and into eternity forever walk about Zion oh consider it the church of the living God consider it the glory of God's kingdom And be like the psalmist and say, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Do you know the verse in Hebrews that says of God, He is not ashamed to be called our God. Oh, I think that's great. And if He is not ashamed to be called our God, should we ever be ashamed to confess his name and to love him and to serve him with our whole heart?